We're going to talk about epilepsy and sleep, and this are, is a topic that, believe it or not, there's such an intricate relationship with, between both that at times it may get a little complex, and it, it, the, the chicken or the egg thing is going to happen. So if you have any questions, just interrupt me. I, I don't mind, uh, uh, especially if you don't understand something I'm trying to explain, okay? So we're going to talk first a little bit about epilepsy, what epilepsy is. Then we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about sleep, because that's something that maybe uh, you guys are not as... Uh, uh, aware or know as much about sleep. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time with that. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the relationship with epilepsy and sleep and vice versa, sleep and epilepsy. Lastly, we're gonna talk about how we can use what we know about them to better uh, treat seizures and also have better sleep quality. We've known that uh, there's a connection between epilepsy and sleep since the type of, times of Hippocrates. Uh, they describe uh, 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 episodes or uh, some poems describe things, uh, things that, that go thump in the night. There's a lot of literature out there that talks about things that happen in the night. And a lot of things could be movement disorders or parasomnias that occur, but the majority of this is probably related to episodes that we're seeing that were epileptic. So what is epilepsy? Dr. Davis talked this morning about the concept of uh, excitation and inhibition. We know that overall the brain works through excitation and inhibition, and it's a very uh, harmonious uh, way that uh, every single thing that we do occurs. Things as complex as language, which I'm speaking right now, occur because the specific parts of the brain are being turned on and specific parts of the brain are being turned off. If there's an imbalance in this, specifically if the excitation is too much or the inhibition is not doing its job inhibiting, that's when uh, the systems may go astray. Uh, and if a specific part of the brain or all of the brain does this, that's when a seizure can occur. If you have a high propensity for that excitation to occur more than the inhibition or the opposite, the inhibition is not occurring correctly, then that means that you're at a higher risk of having seizures and therefore you have epilepsy. What about sleep? Well, it, it makes us, we think when we think about sleep, we think about going to sleep and turning our brains off. And it turns out that sleep is actually a very active state of our, of our brain. Even though a big part of the brain turns off, there's a big part that actually turns on. And that part that turns on is the one that controls the part that's off. And it's actually a very complex and int intrinsic uh, system that, that uh, uh, actually controls uh, how we go to sleep, how we maintain sleep, and we'll talk a little bit more about the architecture of sleep. And, and we know it's important because if we don't sleep, we have problems with memory, our immune system fails, our stress levels go up, and, and, and we know that there's a lot of restorative uh, effects that good sleep can have. It is important to know that, uh, unfortunately, in the 20th century, we've, uh, we've actually played a lot with what normal sleep is. In the old days, when we had no electricity, people would go to sleep when it was dark. And the, the true control of sleep was, was uh, light and darkness. So actually, the sleep architecture and the times that people would go to sleep in the old days was very different than nowadays. Also, the attitude that we had to sleep was very different. In the old days, and if you read poems, you read literature, sleep was a great thing. In fact, there's still some European societies in Spain that have the siestas, which I particularly would love to have here. Uh, <laughs> and you know, they go to sleep and they come back. It makes, it makes, uh, it makes sense in many ways. But since the industrialization uh, and the, actually the light bulb came about, now we can work at night. And all of a sudden, it became more time that we could do more things. And we're in a society now where it almost is a problem to go to sleep. And we have patients come to us to say, saying, you know, I sleep too much. I must have a problem. The fact is that we should sleep seven to nine hours a day. That's a normal average sleep. Everybody's different. But uh, sleep is actually something that's good, and, and, and society has made it something, something of a monster, but it's actually something that we need, and it's very helpful, and we should give the value it, it needs. It works through this inhibition and stimulation of light, uh, hormones accumulated in a specific part of the brains, and tells us that we, that we go to sleep. And in fact, one third of our, of our lifetime we spend in sleep, and then the rest in wakefulness. So if you're, you think about how many years in a lifetime you actually spend sleeping, it's a lot. So uh, there's these three stages of life that you have. Either you're awake, you're in non-REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, or REM sleep. And uh, each of these stages has been very well described based on EEG methods. And it, it tells us how deep we're going to go, uh, what part of sleep we are in, how deep we're going to sleep, and 
how restorative sleep is gonna be. So stage one or two, it's light sleep. It's the beginning of sleep. That's when you can easily be aroused and woken up. It's not very restorative, but it's the beginning of sleep. As you go into third and fourth stage of sleep, if you naturally go into the stages of sleep, that's where you start memory consolidation and rest. But the main, main part that you want to get to is rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. That's where the memory really consolidates. That's where <laughs> dreams occur. That's where um, actually uh, you get the rest of sleep. I'm gonna show you, um, well, these are the patterns that we see in the brain when these stages are occurred. And we can tell that the brain is, is, going, is slowly going to deeper sleep because the waveforms are actually literally slow. But there's other waveforms that tells us there's mechanisms that are actually actively controlling that. And there's a lot of transitions that occur from stage one, stage two, and stage three. When we see a hypnogram or, or a diagram of how people sleep, this is a normal hypnogram. You go from wakefulness, and this is the, uh, the hours of, in time, and this is the stages of sleep. So you go from wakefulness to stage one, two, three, four, and then you go back four, three, two, one, and then you hit REM. It's very interesting because uh, at the point that you hit REM in the EEG, all of a sudden it looks almost like the patient is awake, but there's no muscle movement, and the body is in fact paralyzed. The, the brain paralyzes the body, and even if you're dreaming, you won't act up what you're dreaming, although sometimes I can go astray and people can punch and do things. But uh, in general, when you're in REM, uh, it almost looks like the, the brain is uh, awake, but it's, it, it, it's actually in the most restful and restorative part of sleep. I, I, I think that you need to point, that I need to point out is that REM becomes longer and longer as the cycles occur. And that's very important because every cycle, you get longer and longer time in REM. And the better, the longer you're spending REM, the most restorative the sleep is. If you were to break this cycle, so instead of, have, let's say, sleeping eight hours, you sleep for two hours, wake up, do whatever, sleep again two hours, sleep again two hours, you'll never get this, this amount of REM. You may hit REM once and it's gonna be a small amount. So eight hours of short spurts of sleep is not the same as a consolidated eight hours altogether. You won't get the same sleep. If um, you sleep deprived yourself, you're gonna have different times that you're gonna spend in one and two versus three and four, and maybe you'll never get to REM as much. So it is important that you actually, that we actually try to achieve this normal pattern of sleep. This is affected by many things, including medication and age. We know that as we become older, stage three and four become a little bit shorter, and REM also becomes a, lot, a little bit shorter. So we do know that as we become older, we sleep longer and we're still t more tired than we were before. As before, we used to sleep a lot less time and feel more restored. And that's actually explained by uh, the sleep architecture changes with age. So what is also important about this? It, it's important for you to understand that every time the, the stages are occurring, there's an active system that's being excited or inhibited uh, for it to occur. So in sleep, when you go from stage one to stage two to stage three to REM, the brain is actively changing and going from excitation to inhibition and controlling large, vast parts of the brain. So if we go back to that concept of epilepsy of excitation and inhibition and you look at this diagram and you see all the transitions that have to occur where the brain is actually being turned on and off, you can see if that something goes astray, goes astray, there could be an easy relationship between excitation and inhibition and somebody that already has an underlying problem with that, it could spark up uh, seizures. So I'm not just inventing this, this is clear, there's clear evidence that that happens. In fact, we know that there's some epilepsy syndromes where patients only have seizures even when they're asleep, upon waking up, and sometimes it's a little bit of a mix. Specifically, I could, uh, I could talk a, a whole hour about the specific syndromes and the relations to sleep, but uh, I wanna touch on, up on three things in, in epilepsy. Specifically, nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy is called nocturnal because it only occurs in sleep. It's, uh, in the, it's localized to the frontal lobe. We have a good genetic description of it. Um, but this particular epilepsy syndrome only occurs in sleep. And it can cause very difficult to diagnose seizures because the, the behavior can be so uh, atypical and at times bizarre that it's difficult to know if it's a movement disorder from sleep or it's actually an epilepsy. And we, we I mean, I, I give lectures on how to differentiate a movement disorder from a seizure disorder in, in, at the night. And uh, it's a very well described uh, uh, topic in epilepsy. That's how close the relationship can be. And some scientists may even suggest that the underlying mechanisms that cause parasomnias or movement disorders in sleep are the same ones that cause epilepsy in this type of patients. So it's, it's a very blurred line uh, connection between sleep and epilepsy. 
idiopathic generalized epilepsy, these patients may uh, actually be very susceptible to uh, sleep deprivation, and actually their seizures usually can occur within hours of waking up. So much so that the pattern can be so classic that sometimes we can even tell our patients, well, if your seizures only occur within an hour of sleep, make sure you wake up, do your thing, and don't drive until an hour and we'll let you drive. That's how particularly and, and, and clear cut the, the, the relationship from sleep and awakening can be in this type of epilepsy. Unfortunately, Dr. Ney may have spoken to you about sudden death, uh, uh, sudden unexplained death in epilepsy. Usually that, those deaths occur from sleep, and there's a strong connection with that in, in tractable patients. Uh, what about backwards? When we look at EEGs and we're looking at the stages of sleep, is there a connection between seizures and those stages of sleep? And actually, it turns out that there is. In non-REM, specifically stage two, when we look at that stage, that's the most active stage of epileptiform activity. So in stage two is when basically all this epileptiform activity can come out. It's, a, it's released in a, in, a, in a much prevalent manner, much more prevalent manner. So we use the EEG as a way to, uh, in sleep, as a way to diagnose patients and better understand their epilepsy and treat them. If we know that the patient hasn't gone to sleep during the routine EEG, we may ask them to come back sleep deprived so that the sleep deprivation does two things. Obviously, it makes you go to sleep, but it may expand the time that you're in stage two and uh, one and two in sleep so that those epileptiform activities can come out and we can see and we can better treat the epilepsy. In the ep epilepsy monitoring unit, when we're actually trying to provoke seizures, we can also sleep deprived patients as a way to bring out seizures. The interesting thing is that in REM sleep, actually the epileptic activity is very rare. You barely see any epileptiform activity and very rarely do you see seizures in REM. We don't know why. There's a lot of theories about that, but it's very interesting that in that restorative stage also is the time that seizures are very unlikely to occur. So epilepsy has also a lot of association with comorbid conditions, insomnia, daytime sleepiness, uh, stroptic sleep, sleep apnea, periodic sleep movements, uh, red, restless leg syndrome. All these disorders co-occur with sleep. And we, again, I, I don't know if it's a chicken or the egg. Is it that the epilepsy itself predisposes you to have these diseases or the seizures themselves do it or vice versa? So we do know that they exist. And when we're in the clinic and we notice that this is a problem with the patient, we like to uh, administer uh, sleep in this scale. This scale basically uh, asks a specific number of situations in life that you can be in and tells you, give me from zero to three the, chance that, the, the chances that you will probably fall asleep if this happens. Now, uh, a lot of us maybe will have a good chance of falling asleep if we're sitting and reading, but it can be a little troublesome if we're in the car while well, in the light uh, stopping traffic if we're falling asleep. That tells us how severe things are. And actually, uh, I'm a program director for my residence, so I, I have a lot of fun administering this to my residents who are all sleep deprived because they're taking call all the time. And a lot of them actually have the number 10 or above, which is the cutoff where somebody should be evaluated for a sleep disorder. In fact, actually, a lot of doctors have this from their residency years. So um, how are we going to treat this? So uh, first of all, it is intuitive, though, and we know for a fact that um, better seizure control will create better sleep. And that actually has been shown in many studies. But it, the actual achieving this may not be as easy. Why? Because the medications that we use to treat epilepsy are the same medications that affect the mechanisms that control sleep. GABA, glutamate, all those neurotransmitters that they were mentioning this morning. Those are the, one, the ones that those medications actually affect. And in fact, it's not surprising for you guys and, and for us that when we give you medications for seizures, one of the main complaints is drowsiness, right? It's because they're affecting that. Now, it is not uncommon for a medication to, for the first week, cause that. Now, if after a week you still are having this drowsiness, that's a problem. That's something that you should talk to your epileptologist or neurologist about. Um, this, I'm going to focus on sleep, but I'm going to talk a little bit about drowsiness. So uh, if, if the medication, uh, there's medications that you can actually use that cause less drowsiness and actually we'll talk about improved sleep so that uh, if you talk to your doctor and ask him, uh, tell him, honestly, it's been two weeks, it's been a month, I'm still too sleepy, That's not, that should not be the, the case. Okay, let's talk about the old and the new. So uh, it turns out that we have pretty good data on the old medications and some okay data on the new medications and how it affects actual sleep. Carbamazepine and Tegretol 
actually consolidate sleep. That means people wake up less with, when they're taking this medication. However, even though it increases a slow wave sleep, that's stage three and four, this three and four stage is not, a, is not a very restorative stage three and four. We don't know why. So people actually wake up more tired. And on top of that, their REM stage, which is the one that we really like for them to have, is, is shortened. So this medication, uh, patients seem to wake up uh, with less quality of sleep, even though uh, they seem to be sleeping all night. So this, yeah, doc, I sleep all night, but I'm still tired. That's the type of, of situation that occurs. And if you look at the patterns, uh, it makes sense once you see that the REM is decreased. And that even though the short wave sleep uh, is longer, it, it's not the restorative one that we want. Dilantin, uh, poor old Dilantin, we studied very well, so we know all the side effects. So it's a good medication when you need it, it works. However, because we've studied so well, we know the side effects of it. It actually can cause increased arousal. So when you're sleeping, it, you wake up easier. It reduces REM. It may increase short wave sleep, uh, slow wave sleep at the beginning, but with chronic use that goes away. And that slow wave sleep, again, is not the restorative kind. For some reason, it just doesn't work. So patients on Dilantin may have a lot of uh, excessive daytime sleepiness due to the fact that they're not getting enough REM and they're being woken up multiple times during the night. Valproator Depakote is a sleep stabilizing medication. Uh, it actually works uh, very well in continuously keeping patients asleep. The data on how it affects the architecture itself is not that strong, but it seems to have no major effect and seems to be a pretty good choice of the older medications that we use. What about the new medications? Uh, again, the data is, is very is small, so there's a couple of reviews where they're taking 15 patients a year, 20 patients a year, 30 that they've published on every medication, and they've done sleep studies, and they put it together, and basically this is a summary of that. Uh, gabapentin, neurontin, pregabalin, and lyrga. Turns out that they actually um, reduce awakenings, increases REM, and slow wave sleep. So that sounds great. But anybody here has taken gabapentin knows, knows that during the day you're also going to be very sleepy. Even though your sleep is restful, for some reason the medication itself makes you very groggy. Uh, so um, there's pros and cons, and some patients don't feel it as much. The same with Lyrica. Lamotrigine. Now, I want to pause. Again, I'm, not, I'm, not talk, I'm talking about sleep, but I want to talk about insomnia for a second. Lamotrigine is one of the only antiepileptic drugs that can cause insomnia. So, because it's a twice a day medication, if you notice that you're taking your dose, let's say at 10 o'clock at night, and you're not able to go to sleep till later, maybe you want to sh shift that dose a little bit earlier. Or you can use one of those standard release medications that don't have as high of peak effect, and which causes the insomnia. Now, uh, the other medication that can do this is felbamate, which is not very frequently used, but if anybody's using it, that's something that you have to be take into consideration. Um, now, when you do go to sleep, it does stabilize sleep. It increases REM and reduces stage shift, so it, you're not going back and forth uh, from stages. It, it keeps the architecture very well, and um, it keeps you in the slow wave sleep. So it turns out it has a very good profile once you take it, and um, it, it, it it doesn't affect your daytime sleep. And people are not that groggy with it. it. They can be. Everybody's different. I've seen patients that can get groggy, but in general, people are not as sleepy during the day with it, and it, it, it consolidates sleep very well. Leviteracetam, Keppra, very little side effects on the sleep architecture. It doesn't seem to have many effects. Um, and that has been studied fairly well, and it's been, it's, this medication is so prevalent now that we're getting more and more data on it. So it doesn't seem to affect sleep very in a negative or a positive manner. Uh, we don't know much about lacosigamide, retigavine, Slicarb, all these new medications that are coming on the market because truly uh, there is some evidence there's like cases of three or four, but I don't think it's, it's fair or it would be, be appropriate for me to say what they do because it's just the numbers are too small for us to mention what the effects are. But in general, newer medications seem to have a much better sleep profile in the architecture than older medications. What about BNS? These are very small numbers too, but it seems to improve daytime sleepiness and short wave sleep. Epilepsy surgeries, particularly if the seizures are very well reduced, or actually are your seizure free after epilepsy surgery, now your sleep, uh, total sleep time is much more improved, reduced arousal. Uh, ketogenic diet, diet also improves uh, basically consolidation of sleep or nocturnal sleep. Again, short studies. But um, like I said, 
On the other hand, you also need to uh, approach the, the main problem, which is this excessive daytime sleepiness. And that not, it's not just the seizure control that can help it, but if you uh, adjust your behavior and, uh, and treat it, uh, treat the, the insomnia or the other uh, problems that coexist with epilepsy, you may actually also benefit uh, from better sleep and less seizures. Uh, specifically, uh, a lot of patients use alcohol as their, as their dosing treatment. It works, it may work for the short term, but for the long term, it actually disrupts the architecture. So the sleep latency may be shorter. Sleep latency is the time that patients take to go to sleep. Normally, it should be 15 minutes. These patients now go to sleep at five minutes. So that's good. The problem now, you stay in stage one, stage two more frequently, and guess what? You wake up. And once you wake up, it's very hard to go to sleep. Partly because of this inhibition and excitation. Uh, alcohol is a depressant, but when you wake up, there's a rebound excitation, so now you're more awake, and it's very hard for you to, con to get back to sleep. So um, in the long term, it probably causes more problems than not. So I would avoid alcohol as a use um, to try to help you go to sleep. Uh, behavioral changes, well, I'm going to talk about them. Re reverse learn association, relaxation techniques. Go to sleep at the same time every night and wake up at the same time. That's very helpful. In the weekends, which is what a lot of us do, including me, we all of a sudden decide, oh, we're gonna sleep in. Now we sleep till noon, we sleep till 10, and when we usually wake up at six in the morning or five in the morning. Now that disrupts that cycle. And then you try to get back on Monday, and you try to get back to the normal cycle, and your cycle is already disrupted, and it takes time for that to already get back into the normal architecture. So even on weekends, even on, on holidays, try to keep that, that exact wake, wake up and going to bed time especially if you're having difficulties with sleep. Uh, avoid naps, and if you're gonna nap, make sure that they're less than an hour and before four o'clock. Uh, if you're not sleepy, stay out of the room. The room is not for you to, to try to be there sitting, running around and trying to go to sleep. If you're not sleepy, get out, try to do something relaxing, and uh, until you're tired, that's where you use sleep. Um, if you're also in the bedroom, try not to study, do work, uh, do your taxes, anything that's stressful in the bedroom, because that's clearly, you're gonna associate your bedroom with that, with the stress of that, and you don't want that. Uh, you want your bedroom to be a sanctuary, you wanna be peaceful, you wanna be a place that you related with sleep. Uh, if you're gonna do exercise, actually, it can be very beneficial f for sleep, but try to avoid doing it uh, within five hours of the time you're gonna go to sleep. So wait, uh, if you're gonna uh, exercise, make sure you have five hours between the time you're actually planning to go to sleep. Uh, wind down within an hour of the time you're gonna go to sleep. Make sure that the sanctuary includes dark, a dark room, a cold room, low noise, um, and no light. Uh, turns out that all these uh, devices that we use, cell phones, iPads, computers, they're in the right wavelength to make that hormones that we showed you that keep you awake, that send the signal to the brain to stay awake, those are in the same wavelength, wavelength as that. So you're sending, every time that you're going to sleep, you're telling your brain, stay awake, stay awake, while you're trying to go to sleep while looking at Facebook or doing, using the internet or doing or watching TV. And you can get very tired, but somehow you're still telling your sig signal in your brain to stay awake. You're counteracting the normal effects of light. Uh, so avoid all that light. Take away it all, if you possible, don't, don't, don't take your cell phone, your iPad, your computer, your TV should be out of the bedroom. Make it dark. Um, don't eat heavy meals, you can eat a light snack. If you have something that bothers you, write it down and put it down. Don't think about it all night, you'll wor worry about it tomorrow. Um, if you see that you're in the bedroom and you're not going to sleep, get up and go somewhere else. Uh, again, you wanna stop that association of anxiety of trying to go to sleep and, uh, and remaining awake. So you go uh, to your couch and try to do something relaxing, reading, something that uh, doesn't keep you up, not watching TV or something that excites you and it's gonna make it harder to go. And try to put the clocks away so you're not all night looking at the clock and say, oh my God, it's very late, I have to give an epilepsy foundation talk tomorrow and so I need to go to sleep. So, so just make sure you put them away in a place that you can't see them. If you go to the American Sleep Association, they have great tips. They only have information about uh, how to go to sleep, but also about different, uh, different circadian rhythm or sleep-wake cycle uh, problems that patients can have. And if you see that, you can inform yourself. Maybe you have other issues that are comorbid with your epilepsy that you can educate yourself about and, and maybe learn how to treat. 
they have a top 10 sleep tips. It's basically what I just said before, a little bit more summarized. Um, what about sleep apnea? So as you know, sleep apnea is an anatomical problem with uh, the airway where there's an obstruction during sleep. The muscles relax, it closes up the airway. There's no inflow of uh, oxygen and the actual brain starts accumulating CO2, you're suffocating, and it says, hey, you're, you're not breathing, it wakes you up. It wakes you up for uh, a limited amount of time, seconds. You don't even realize you wake up, but you woke up. And it makes that sleep architecture that we talked about, it disrupts it every time. So now you're never gonna get to that nice long REM because you're waking up multiple times in the, in the night. Interesting enough, uh, there's some evidence that patients with refractory epilepsy who have sleep apnea, if it's treated aggressively, may improve with their seizure control. So that, that's very interesting. And, and so if you notice that you're having excessive, excessive daytime sleepiness, if you do the sleepiness scale and you notice that you have a number 10 or above, you should seek a, a, a consultation from a sleep specialist. Maybe sleep apnea could be treated and it may help not just your sleep but your seizures. So overall, Make sure that you have the right medication. Try to avoid seizures. Try to use the right medication or, or the newer medication for seizure control. Practice at all times good sleep hygiene. If you have a comorbid condition, sleep apnea or restless legs or any other condition, talk to your neurologist or, or sleep doctor about it to see if that can be treated. And modulate uh, specific factors that we talked about, specifically avoid alcohol use, okay? And I hope you all sleep well. <laughs>